Okay, so um, I've been given in a way a difficult task because I'm at, uh, at the same time one of the co-panelists and at the same time a moderator. So I will make it very short in the beginning, just introducing very shortly the topic of the panel and uh, uh, my co-panelist. Uh, it seems that uh, the new generation of historians is very feminized here. Um, so <clears throat> the topic is uh, the, nec um, uh, the next generation new interpretations of recent European history. I asked uh, Dominique Pic uh, to tell me how to understand a new generation and who is new and who is old. So he told me basically that new are all those who started studying after 80, uh, 1989. So the question is, if this change that we didn't study in the 90s, that we did experience, if we are from Eastern Europe, communism only as children, if this influences our thinking about history. Um, and I must say, I had the chance to read some of the presentations uh, a couple of days ago. And uh, for me, it was very interesting to see how very, very different approaches we took on the, on the topic. Uh, so let me now shortly introduce um, uh, my co-panelists. There is uh, Irit Dekel, who is an Israeli researcher uh, at the moment, a research fellow at the Humboldt University, and she uh, and a member of the Bath College in Berlin, and uh, she was, um, or is, and was uh, studying, uh, or is uh, researching in an international Israeli-German research project on uh, home museums in Israel and Germany, uh, and uh, was also researching in the. Holocaust Memorial Museum, I understand, on Israeli and German groups. No? You can correct me later. Um, visiting the memorial. Um, we have um, Sandra Vok. Uh, she comes from Estonia uh, and is at the moment a, a, a manager at, uh, <clears throat> and coordinator at the UNITAS Foundation, which is a foundation, as I understood from the homepage, mainly dealing with, with historical education. Yes, and, hu hu and human yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. historical and human rights education. Uh, she studied uh, cultural studies, anthropology and governance, uh, and she made her MA uh, at the Oxford University, and she studied also at the Swedish Institute. And we have, uh, last but not least, Lenka uh, Koprivova from uh, from, from, from the Czech Republic, who studied uh, or graduated in uh, Russian and Eastern European studies here at the University in Prague, uh, and is working currently for the Memory of Nations uh, Foundation, which is, I understand, collecting oral history accounts, uh, but maybe you will talk a bit yeah. more about that uh, in your presentation. And. Um, me, I'm Sofia Wojcicka. I'm currently working at the House of European History in Brussels. I'm a historian from Poland, from Warsaw. Was before working mainly on a, um, memory of Second World War um, in in Poland, uh, in comparison to other countries. And this was my main field of research before I came here. Um, maybe we start from the left. If you like to start, Edith. Well, thanks so much for the invitation to be here. It's a great honor. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read uh, part and talk part. The, the uh, topic and title of my um, talk today is Memory of the, of the Past, Lamentations of the Present, question mark. And I start with a poem. I buy in this store milk and white bread, the one they call wedding. With a the change, there was often a handful of pistachios where I had to try some of the olives, freshly delivered and with, the, with an almond stuffed inside. No more almonds would be placed in these olives. The long white breads are wasted. The milk is sour. There is no bread that is called wedding. There was the bride, the one that has no father, 
um, who would lead her dance. The store is empty, burned. Ask not why. Ask not, is it the war? A crusade without children, with flags, the ones stuck by men in their belts. I go back to my store. I mark all over the closed shades, want to give the dead men in there a white bread, a tea. The tea is cold and the rims of the glass already discolored. The tea is cold and the rims of the glass already discolored. On the next morning I come, I say, on the next morning and give you back again a white bread and a glass full of hot, sweet black tea. This is a lamentation that opens the book Flowers for Otello by poet, essayist, educator, theater and music author Esther Dischereit and culminates her engagement in the memory of the neo-Nazi underground uh, murder of 10 citizens uh, in Germany between 2000 and 2007. It was just published in March. Acknowledging a diversity of memories, as the two former ENRS conference concluded, is a necessary precondition uh, for a healthy EU community after 2004. But memory continues to mark national belongings of cohesive groups whose former generations partook in that past together. Those who do not belong because they do not share stories and sentiments pertaining to their telling are not tolerated. First, for their migration background status. Second, because of their presumed inferior class. Third, because they are assumed not to be committed to the same values learned and shared by the German majority after the extensive memory work done uh, post-World uh, War II. To my view, only by opening up the question of new publics, new problems they face, and to diversity in memories, as Aita Marie Uhl um, pointed in her talk and her question earlier, not of who suffered more, but instead, what does it mean today to be a Turk, a Jew, a migrant from a poor country, woman, a Muslim, young or old in Germany, in the same way that we should ask what it meant to be a socialist, a woman, perhaps gay, perhaps Jewish, or half a Jew, or Roma in the 30s, and onward. And also what it means to take their belongings, or to not to say anything when they are ex um, excluded today. Esther Dischereit sat in the Bundestag hearings about the NSU murder of 10 Turkish origin citizens and a police woman. She wrote the opera libretto Flowers for Otello that I mentioned, of which that was the opening poem um, that I read, parts of I read, and I translated uh, from German. Based on her research and experience in the hearing and later in the trial in Munich, whose hundredth day was just celebrated and acknowledged in the German press um, last week. It is an artistic and documentary tour de force about the everyday lives dreams and loss of those individuals and families and the German public sphere on the topic, which was published as a book in March. She grounds the choice of the figure of Otello, why Otello? Um, that he was black in those interviews uh, about the, uh, the book, but why lamentations? For since 1990, 152 people were victims um, of right radical violence and she wanted above all to lead a public lamentation. Could it or could she? Is there all a public lamentation for the murder on ethnic and racial ground after 1990, but informed uh, in many ways uh, by the changes that we do or don't discuss um, um, in, in, in 89? Could there be a public lamentation on racial ground that was not detected as such, and when it was, documents were discarded or disappeared, and the public had looked away? I would like to connect this burning question to the often heard lamentation over the right way to remember the GDR uh, and memory in Germany post-1989, which is framed by a moral superiority of remembering the Holocaust as a singular event, as a, by a binary division of uh, victims and perpetrator, and by class. How are we to make sense of the connection between the victim's narrative of both Nazism and GDR, um, the fact that the GDR victims are often accused, and not always without ground, of conservatism and right-leaning attitudes, and of xenophobia, and therefore they feel doubly victimed, victimized. Uh, and the sustained closeness to new publics who did not experience those regimes, uh, but share the public sphere in Central and Eastern Europe, or did experience those regimes. I mean, if you think about Muslims in Germany uh, that came in the 50s, actually they have memories of the GDR. Um, and, and, and the collapse um, of the GDR, Jews also. 
even though, as, as they say, uh, they were, uh, you know, three to four hundred pieces of them in the GDR, but uh, yeah. Um, okay. It, 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 that, that's the inner, inner the humor. Uh, okay, not victimizing or victimized in any way. Um, as the um, ENRS last year in Berlin hopefully concluded, memory can unite or divide and has above all to be active in seeking dialogue, which is what we're doing uh, these days here. But a dialogue about what and among whom? Can we call this dyadic imposition of German, say, on the Turk in years of anti-anti-Semitic courses um, dialogue? Or can we see it as a dialogue on predefined topics, all too rehearsed binary terms of victims and heroes? Or perhaps instead, the everyday of those who have no access to participating in it, which means that they are also vulnerable to ethnic exclusion on a daily basis because they're not considered active bearers of memory and because theirs is irrelevant, disturbing uh, to central memorial narratives we have very hard time stepping out of, even informed by the memory of GDR, which added yet another layer of injustice and victims to that of the dictatorship which preceded it. It might, in my ethnographic research or, or participant observation in 60 guided tours and workshops in, in the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin, the Eisenman one, uh, in German, Hebrew, and English, but it wasn't comparing uh, Germans and Israelis, but mostly since the predominant group uh, of, uh, or groups touring the memorial and get, getting into tours as trapped uh, groups, I mean, it's school children, uh, are German. Uh, so the, the bulk of the research was, uh, was on, on attitudes toward memory as they are performed um, in the memorial. Uh, I found that the Jew is not presented as an equal and active bearer of memory, let alone the Muslim German citizen. Jews are what I call category of memory. <coughs> so what is it? They're remembered as a cohesive mur murdered group, second, confined to the time of the Holocaust into the space of Europe, and third, represented by a voice of the survivors. Image, um, images and evidence of their extinction and by Jewish religious symbolism. The Star of Davis was, but, but was huge in uh, uh, how uh, students uh, um, um, did artwork in the memorial about what it means to remember the Holocaust and also in the designs proposed for the memorial. While the Jews are revered as an important remnant of the past, the Muslim is accused of being unable to partake in democracy and of being anti-Semitic. This attitude travels into memory and dealing with xenophobia and racism today. Others, quote, mm. or unquote, are accused of it. These others should take care of the memory of their own losses. Um, as sociologists Michal Bodeman and, and Goethe Yudekul noted, this is part of their learning diaspora, right? I mean, migrants uh, near and far learn to be diasporic as relating to the memory, the German memory and memory narratives in, 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 in Germany. Jews and Turks relate to each other as excluded groups. In numerous German radio and newspaper interviews, Dischereit uh, is very often asked, are you going to keep doing this? Are you going to keep dealing with exclusion and racism? I mean, isn't it enough? Okay, the Jew is writing about the Turk, it's pretty sexy, but I mean. Um, always after the newspaper discloses that she's Jewish. We saw the same tendency of minorities to relate to each other within an exclusionary public sphere around the debate on circumcision in, in, in 2012, in the summer of 2012. For how the Germans commemorate the NSO murders? The hearings in the Bundestag opened with the National Memorial Ceremony in February 23, 2012, which was effective and effective. Memorial ceremonies can introduce new ideas beside old ones. They can bring the memory of a difficult and unfinished past together by linking it to the dangers of xenophobia, to the Holocaust, racism, discrimination, and tolerance. And this is a positive sign, and it was done in that um, um, ceremony. But we have to be aware to what strategies are employed in those commemorative events. So that, that's to relate to the question of do we have one narrative? Well, even if we don't have one narrative, and we shouldn't, um, we have actors that play roles that are rehearsed and, and come back, and we have the... Um, um, uh, means of addressing those roles and playing them that are also very well rehearsed. So which memories are celebrated and which issues are left intact? The memorial ceremony had the same structure of reading, lighting candles, music, and testimony that Holocaust ceremonies events have. Political scientist Jenny Wurstenberg points to this phenomenon as an outcome of the fact that victim groups of the GDR entered the memory landscape of the Nazi regime. 
She shows that the families of GDR victims tend to be critical of the ways their stories are not told with the same urgency and centrality in, comparing, in comparison to, to Holocaust victims. And the Berlin Memorial landscape had known quite significant changes uh, because of civil society actors in the past few years. I mean, if you think about the mid-2000s uh, forward. And these actors demanded uh, and created um, more visibility and tolerance to this perspective. While also, and I'm not saying this as a, as a negative sign, but the urgency to remember the Holocaust is receding. It was mentioned here as the competing remembrance days uh, uh, epitomize that. Now, once it is more included, once GDR state crimes and violence is represented centrally in Berlin, in museums, in memorials, in train stations, and other sites, um, in books and marking in the center of the city, does the German society grow more tolerant to others suffering from policy-related and simple commonsensical xenophobia? My answer is no. This is the first book, um, Flowers for Otello, in German, and in German and Turkish, it's, it's um, uh, translated into Turkish, uh, about the murdered, the NSU murders, uh, which were exposed in 2012 after the police did not see them as ethnic-based crimes. I mean, it was uh, assumed that the Turks are just killing the Turks and they're poor, um, um, yeah, I mean, poverty-related, um, um, low-class crime. Disha Haidt, a daughter of a Holocaust survivor, said to me in a private conversation, I'm quoting, my father wrote that it took 12 families to hide him from two, for two years um, and for him to survive underground, unquote. Imagine how many families, she says, sorry, not unquote, um, it took for the planning and execution of those murders. The German memory culture, um, about to finish, um, is influenced by recent historical changes, by metaphors on loan as framing mechanisms which are not politicized and not used for call for action, as lamentation. Now, lamentations, we know from their biblical form, are very strong. And in Disha Reit's book, there is the first part, followed by names of the victims, by trial parts, and other segments of reality that make clear that this is a political outcry. However, their call for action is distilled during the very performance so that one ends up, at best, with a cathartic experience of self-cleansing, which we also see around other uh, memorial um, initiatives. The agency of the actual present-day minorities is carefully crafted to reflect German memory work carried also by a cohesive group which inherited the responsibility to, to remember and can grant this responsibility to worthy groups um, which demonstrate the capacities to perform this specific kind of memory work. This is um, uh, demonstrated by uh, Rothberg and Yildiz. In this way, the discourse on minorities in Germany is not affected, nor is it productively informed by the discourse on the memory of the Jews and following dictatorship. However, as one could see in the debate on circumcision in Germany in the summer and fall of 2012, both, discuss, uh, both discussing minorities' rights and tradition in Germany and discussing Jewish life in Germany today are marked by the discourse on remembering uh, the Holocaust, as well as by the fear of anti-Semitic convictions. Um, in other words, the discourse on shame and guilt colors the treatment of Jews as well as of Muslims in Germany today in ways that make both groups potential victims and thus less accountable and less politically potent, casting the Muslim as particularly dangerous to the memory of the Jews. That was another reason why Esther Dijahat uh, was asked again and again, are you going to keep remembering the Turks? Aren't they dangerous to you? Um, this also affects the likely visibility of memory initiatives <coughs> that challenge this division as well rehearsed roles of Germans and Jews, right? The Jew, as, as Sander Gilman uh, shows us, is, is both within the German public imaginary and outside. I mean, it's now also post-1989 a migrant, but we have Germans that were in Germany before, so that's a duality that is interesting and very potent. We could use the memory of the GDR to inform us about the condition of minorities, of old age narratives about them, of changing social fabrics and political structures, and of doubt in old ones. Or we can recede comfortably into celebrating how well memory work is done among groups such as ourselves, where former descendants of victims and perpetrators sit together and discuss their memories. This is an important, inevitable entry point to the harder work we should face in acknowledging the other and otherness, not merely that of the past. Thank you.
Okay, so in, in a way, if I understand well, we had an outlook on what is still missing. Um, and uh, I'm now curious to hear what uh, Lenka Koprivova will say. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Já využiju svého práva mluvit v češtině, tak tento příspěvek bude tady v češtině. Když jsem byla požádána organizátory, abych tady vystoupila na konferenci, tak to zadání znělo tak, že bych měla promluvit o tom, jaké výzvy musíme čelit při popularizaci dějin u mladých lidí. Já svý příspěvek jsem si přichystala na základě svých zkušeností vlastní, které jsem získala zejména při projektech s pamětníky, oral historických projektů, z, čeho, z čehož nejdéle jsem o projektu Paměť národa, Memory of Nations, asi pět let. A kromě toho, že my děláme dokumentaci, natáčíme rozhovory s pamětníky, tak vlastně máme i hodně aktivit, které potom tedy tyhle výsledky se snaží komunikovat veřejnosti dále. To první a zásadní, ta hlavně, hlavní výzva, které čelíme, je, že jak vlastně vůbec vysvětlit, k čemu jsou znalosti dějin dobré a proč by se lid, mladí lidé o ně měli zajímat. Jakým, pardon, pardon. Jakým vysvětlit, že historie nejsou jen jména a čísla, ale celkem praktické věci, které nás potkávají v denním životě. Myslím si, že když tady tohle dokážeme, tak máme vyhráno. Ten druhý krok, který musíme učinit, je hlavně na nás. A musíme si ujasnit, co vlastně chceme předávat. Já jsem toho názoru, že zprostředkovávání dějin není pouze o obsahu, ale také o schopnostech a dovednostech, které si člověk může při jejich poznávání osvojit. Mám třeba na mysli vnímání světa v souvislostech, snahu pochopit různé motivace a pohnutky, respekt vůči odlišným názorům, ale také empatii, kritické myšlení, schopnost analyzovat stroje informací. Můžeme doufat, že toto jsou vlastnosti, které historici mají, ale myslím si, že ani v popularizaci dějin by to nemělo být opomíjeno. Tím se dostávám k další otázce, kterou nám pořádatelé na začátku položili, a to, jaký je význam evropské kultury vzpomínání ve srovnání s jednotlivými národními narrativy. Z mého pohledu evropská kultura vzpomínání není pouze o tom obsahu, o tom jednom dominantním narrativu, který se prosadí, ale naopak, že to zásadní pro ně jsou vlastnosti, které jsem právě zmínila, zejména tedy to snaha porozumět jiným pohledům a jiným perspektivám. Já bych teď ráda přešla, nebudu mluvit už moc obecně, ale ráda bych vám ukázala nějaké projekty, z naší strany, které se ukázaly jako úspěšné právě při té práci po popularizaci dějin u veřejnosti. První zásada, která vlastně myslím si, že je dobré jít ctít, tak je jít s lidmi přímo a oslovit je. Myslím, že pasivní přístup ve vztahu k veřejnosti, kdy připravíme výstavu, knihu, nějakou akci a dále čekáme, že si je cílové publikum najde, se, na to se moc poléhat nedá. Naopak. Když nejde hora k Mohamedovi, musíme, musí Mohamed hoře. Vyplatí se tedy dělat výstavy ve veřejném prostoru a také dát jim formu, aby si jich lidé všimli. Aby si jich všimli lidé, kteří jdou jen tak okolo, aby to zbudilo jejich zdědavost, aby prostě dostali chuť něco nového se dozvědět. Já bych poprosila Sandra, Já vám ukážu to je příklad výstavy, kterou jsme připravili před dvěma lety. Tenkrát bylo výročí atentátu na Reinharda Heydricha a my jsme přemýšleli, jak vlastně tady tohle výročí připomenout. Možná víte, že po to, co byl Reinhard Heydrich tady zabit, zastřelen, tak následovaly velké, velké represe vůči českému obyvatelstvu. Mnoho Čechů bylo potom posláno do koncentračního tábora Mauthausen, kde i zemřeli. A ta idea, kterou, kterou jsme měli, byla velmi kontroverzní od začátku. A vlastně my jsme nevěděli, jak bude fungovat, osvědčí se to, neosvědčí se to, nebude to spíše kompraproduktivní. A vznikl tedy nápad postavit, umístit výstavu do kulis koncentračního tábora, který byl postaven přímo v centru Prahy. Bylo to na místě, které 
denně, kolem kterého denně prochází stovky a stovky lidí a vlastně se to osvědčilo. Během toho jednoho měsíce, kdy tam výstava byla, tak ji navštívilo asi 30 tisíc návštěvníků. Ten obrázek byl ten úplně první, který Sandra ukazovala. Když jsem mluvila o tom, jak je důležité jít přímo za lidmi a oslovit je, tak druhý taková úspěšná aktivita, kterou jsme měli v loňském roce, byla dokumentaristická soutěž. Vyhlásili jsme ji tedy poprvé loni a protože se ujala, tak letos pokračujeme v ní a cílem této dokumentaristické soutěže bylo vzbudit v lidech zájem o příběhy, které se nachází v jejich okolí. A tak byla vlastně orientovaná i kampaň, která ji doprovázala. Motem bylo, jaký je příběh tvé mámy, jaký je příběh tvého dědy, jaký je příběh tvého souseda. My sami jsme se vydali do ulic českých měst, bavili jsme se s lidmi a snažili jsme se těmito rozhovory pozbudit, aby zaspomínali, jaké zajímavé životní osudy mají ve svém okolí. Soutěž se setkala také s velkým úspěchem a když to kvantifikujeme, tak asi 600 lidí se jí zúčastnilo. A co nás překvapilo, tak příspěvky, které poslali, tak byly na opravdu velmi dobré a kvalitní úrovni. Druhá zásada, kterou si myslím, že je dobré respektovat při popularizaci dějin, je používat soudobé metody komunikace. Tady bych zase ráda ukázala jeden, jednu aktivitu, která se nám ukázala jako celkem úspěšná. Je to The Comics? Je to komiks, komiksová kniha Ještě jsme ve válce. Jednalo se vlastně o 13 příběhů 13 konkrétních pamětníků, s nimi jsme natočili rozhovor, které výtvarně stvárnilo 13 českých a slovenských výtvarníků. Ta nosná myšlenka nebyla pouze v tom vyprávět příběh obrázkem, ale také stvárnit příběh z perspektivy mladého člověka, který ho právě zažívá. Takže už to není ten uh, starý člověk v letech, pamětník, který nám vypráví, jak to kdysi dávno bylo, ale mladý hrdina, s ním je možné se identifikovat. Um, Sandra vám právě ukazuje několik uh, obrázků z té knížky komiksové. A myslím si, že to je, um, když nevážno to, že uh, musí, hrdina, s ním je možné se identifikovat, tak myslím si, že to je celkem důležitý dome, moment při zpřístupňování dějin veřejnosti. Teď tedy v případě, kdy pracujeme s pamětníky. Já mám celkem často dojem, že hodně, nebo mám dojem, že někdy se nám stává, že sklouzneme k tomu, že z pamětníka se nám podaří udělat spíše muzejní exponát, ne abychom vytěžili to kouzlo z toho příběhu, které je opravdu možné použít a které ty lidi osloví, ale pamětníka dáme za takovou skleněnou stěnu a vlastně mezi ním a mezi tím příjemcem té informace vytvoříme bariéru. Myslím si, že je dobré dávat se na to pozor, abychom nesklouzávali tímhle směrem. A soudobé metody komunikace, když tedy ještě jeden příklad ukážu, tak je to například mobilní aplikace. Myslím si, že mobilní aplikace je celkem vhodná forma, jak poznatky z dějin předávat dál. My máme zkušenosti s mobilní aplikací Místa paměti národa, která je založena na myšlence místo a příběh, který se na něm odehrál. Uživatel, který má um, tuto aplikaci ve svém mobilu, tak si může buď to pustit vyprávění pamětníka, které se k místu váže, může si přečíst texty, může si prohlédnout fotografie. My jsme tady tu aplikaci vyvinuli před dvěma lety, v současné době má asi 800 míst a letos jsme ji ještě rozšířili. Udělali jsme z ní mezinárodní verzi a ta mezinárodní verze není jenom v tom, že texty jsou v angličtině, ale vzhledem k tomu, že letos je výročí pádu železné opony, tak my jsme se orientovali na toto výročí, oslovili jsme partnery v Německu, na Slovensku, v Chorvatsku, v Maďarsku, v Rumunsku a dalších evropských zemích a požádali, aby cíleně hledali příběhy, které se vážou k železné oponě. A protože jsme věděli, že vzniká cyklotrasa, stezka železné opony, Eurovelo 13, což je jedna z těch páteřních evropských cyklostezek, tak jsme si vlastně i řekli, že když ty příběhy budeme dávat do aplikace, tak je budeme umistovat tak, aby lidé, kteří potom po této cestě se vydají a které jedou, tak aby měli k dispozici vlastně takový, takový průvodce ve své, ve své kapsy. A tady bych se znovu vrátila k tomu, co jsem říkala, 
Myslím si, že při popularizaci dějin pro veřejnosti je velmi důležité mít na vědomí, kdo by mohl mít o to zájem a jakou formou mu informace předat, tak aby pro něho byla zajímavá, aby pro něho byla atraktivní. Tak tím bych ráda skončila. Thank you very much. So we've been talking already a bit about um, modern communication techniques. I guess we will focus even more on that in the next presentation. So may I invite Sandra Vok to. Thank you very much. Um, yes, indeed, that's true. I'm going to focus very much on modern communication methods and uh, looking into the future. And. Um, It is said that it's a good idea to uh, start with a quote of somebody famous, so I'll do just that. Uh, John Lennon has said that life happens while we are busy making other plans. And I would like to rephrase that for our occasion here. Um, life happens while we are busy trying to jump on board. So what I mean with that is we're desperately trying to adapt proven methods to our field while we actually should be focusing on innovation. Um, just, just an example to illustrate what I mean, I recently handed in a project report and uh, the funding body sent me additional inquiries about the dissemination um, methods asking for DVDs. And um, we had distributed most of our materials online, so it took me a considerable amount of time to go and buy the DVDs, burn them, go to the post office, sit there, wait, send them, come back, not to mention the, the costs for, for the environment and, and the particular one DVD that I messed up and had to throw away. Um, so what I'm, what I'm, I, I'm, I understand um, the, that the institutions take time to change and adapt to change, but at the same time, what I would like to call upon for, for, all, for all of us here is that we should devote more time, effort and also money in developing new technologies. Just as an example, very much um, following from what Lenka said, the Unitas Foundation is also currently working on a project that collects stories and finds new um, methods for, for telling them. And, and one of these ways is, is developing an online totalitarian experience. So I'm sure many of you have visited places like uh, the Terror House Museum or Yad Vashem. And What you experience there is very close and very personal. Now imagine this um, on an online platform so that you don't need to physically go to that place, but you can access it and relive or, or just live those experiences there. So um, we can start doing that from rethinking um, the way we think in general about remembrance and history, but also the way we speak about it. Um, and this also s serves as a suggestion to redefine the title of this panel from new interpretations of European history to new experiences of European history. And I use experience here purposefully instead of interpretation because today we can't no longer talk about only writing and interpreting history. Uh, the way we experience time and space is changing very fast. We are increasingly interconnected with other people, with objects, with space. And the next generation, um, I would like to actually redefine what uh, the organizers have meant by that as well. It's not necessarily a new generation of, of people, it's also all of us here. So all of us are the next generation in the very near future. And we will be able to experience and immerse ourselves in the memories, the experiences, the stories of not only ourselves, but also other people. And, and do it and experience it in a way um, that if it were life as it happens. So what can be, what is real can also become virtual and vice versa.
So just some examples of, um, of what I'm talking about. We, have, we are already talking about the Internet of Things, which is objects interconnected via a network without any human interaction. We are talking about the worldwide wireless web, which is, which is a real wireless world um, without any limitations to connection. We're talking about bioinformatics, which is the use of computers to model living phenomena. And we're talking about immersive virtual reality, which is basically an artificial environment that feels like real life. So this means that history is going to be experienced and designed for the users or what perhaps could be called also the participants. And following from that, design, experience design and storytelling will become the relevant tools for talking about history and for mediating the historical narratives. And I use mediating instead of writing because the idea of narrative is also shifting from these very defined categories of spatial and textual and sensory uh, representations from more to, to more fluid notions of transmedia and transsensory experiences. So stories of recent European history should be also told via multiple platforms and technologies because no single media any longer satisfies our curiosity and our lifestyle. We are living in a universe of content and opportunities and the people that we want to tell these stories to have now the technology to navigate in this universe and choose where they want to stop and for how long. So in this sense, technology and the free markets allow levels of unprecedented customization and personalization so that a top-down approach as well as a single um, one-size-fits-all policy is no longer acceptable. And to conclude, memories and history will be brought to life across different techn technologies and interfaces and history telling will be increasingly a bottom-up process. Instead of multiple interpretations, we are going to talk about multiple experiences of history, which is going to provide a way to engage with, with history in a way that has never been possible before. And if we, all of us here, if we really want to have a strong and meaningful impact, I propose the following. Firstly, funders should increase support for technological innovation and development. Secondly, project promoters should educate themselves in information communications technologies and actively engage in future forecasting. And thirdly, we must establish interdisciplinary cooperation, meaning that history researchers, historians, educators should involve the creative and the information technology, technology industries, <coughs> such as designers, programmers, game developers, animators, etc. We should not try to keep jumping on board the innovation train, we should be leading it. Thank you. So I must say, I already now have a lot of questions. Um, but maybe first I will make my own very short statement. I must say I was um, quite embarrassed when I was uh, invited to this panel because uh, since some time I don't uh, treat myself any longer as a representative of the new generation. And after the last presentations, I even less feel so. This is my 10-year-old mobile phone. <laughs> But it has a very interesting story to tell because it remembers the Orange Revolution, uh, which it witnessed. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> uh, so I guess, um, in a way, I'm still a representative of the, well, what we would call here the old generation, in that sense that. Uh, I was born in the mid-70s and I still spend a big part of my childhood 
under communism, and I guess this has an influence on also my thinking as a historian. But I still try to make out what the difference would be if we define the new generation as those who started studying after, 19, uh, 90, uh, after 1989. And um, I try to think about my colleague historians, my peers, and one of the important differences I see, at least uh, in Poland, is that historians of, let's say, my generation um, would more often deal with uh, what we would call social history and history of everyday life than it is the case in, uh, with older historians. Um, and I think this has a very direct implication on how we um, me and my colleagues tend to look at contemporary Polish and also European history and on the questions we are asking. Um, so I guess for us, if I can speak for us, um, it's um, not so much uh, a history, contemporary history, it's not so much a history of repression, political opposition and communist crimes. To refer to what Marcy Shore um, said yesterday, it's less a story of victims and perpetrators, and we don't all ask so much about guilt. What is rather interesting for us is everyday life under communism, but also deeper social change caused by the system and how it influences where we are today. So to show that there is no um, interwar period then a big cut and then we come back to what was before 39, but that there is a deeper change and to understand what is happening now we have to understand the, the changes which the societies have undergone in the past decades. But it's also the question about adaptation strategies of average people to the regime, I'm still talking about Central Eastern Europe, the zones of freedom, what in Germany we would call the Freiräume, the mechanisms of servitude, but also, which I think came a bit short uh, in the discussions uh, yesterday, the dynamic of, of protest. So it's not only the victimization, so to say, and the repression, but also how people, without telling a very heroic story of heroic individuals, what is the um, dynamic of people becoming, uh, going into resistance in different ways. This also means that the focus of historical research shifts, I guess, uh, from Stalinism to later periods, to the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, and to give you only some examples of topics, my colleagues from Poland, but also from other countries like Germany or Ukraine, um, and here I can mention only a few names, but you could mm, mention many more. Marcin Zaremba is maybe a bit an older generation, Błażej Brzostek, uh, Katarzyna Chimiak, uh, Sofia Diak, uh, Joanna Wawrzyniak are dealing with. I will give you only some topics so that you have a kind of um, imagination what, what I'm talking about. Is, for example, uh, the big, uh, the hunger winter or the, the, the grave winter of 46, 47, as experienced in Soviet Union, Poland, Great Britain, and Germany, a comparative work. Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainization of Lviv and Polonization of Wrocław after World War II. <clears throat> um, I would say the brutalization and uh, traumatization of the Polish society in the first post-war years in cause of World War II and its result for, 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 for the society. Economic shortages and queuing culture in Poland private commercial and cultural contacts between the GDR and Poland uh, uh, during communist times. Of course, again, this is a general, um, and sorry, maybe I should add one thing. This kind of change of topics refers also partly to the research on World War II, I guess. 
um, particularly on the Shoah and Polish-Jewish relations during the war. Um, Groundbreaking research has been done in this field based on social history and microhistory by the Center for Holocaust Research at the Polish Academy of Science. And although here the term new generation does not fully apply because the founders uh, of this uh, center are historians or uh, researchers from the older generation, Barbara Engelking, Boni, Jacek, Lociak, still there are quite some young collaborators. Um, and I, of course, uh, it's a generalization and probably we'll have a discussion and some will rise here also my Polish colleagues and say it's, it's simplification. Of course, they are still very many, or not still, there are very many Polish researchers, also young researchers still dealing very much with political repressions, armed underground political opposition, but for sure, there are now much more works like mentioned than only a couple of years before. Um, and as you can see even on the given examples, there is also quite some comparative studies or studies focused on what we would call l'histoire croisée. Um, and this is connected to the second and last point I would like to make. Uh, for me and my colleagues, it um, was, I guess, much more obvious than for historians of the older generation, and here again I speak mostly about Central Eastern Europe, to study and work abroad and participate in international projects. So we profited in a way from what uh, Heide Marie Uhl uh, yesterday called the new communication space, which developed after 89. And this again influences our thinking about history. I guess my generation was uh, from the beginning trained more in thinking in a broader international context. And um, uh, I think, although this is also a question to the other panelists, but also to the audience, uh, this would apply also to other European countries. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, and I guess um, this uh, can make it maybe a bit easier for, let's say again, us, um, maybe not to um, build up a new uh, European master narrative, and I don't think anybody here thinks this is uh, even possible but at least to tell European history in such a way that it takes into account and allows to compare and confront those different historical experiences, but also uh, interpretations, um, and uh, also taking into account not only political history, but broader social and economical changes in whole regions, or even comparing Western and Eastern Europe, uh, not forgetting about Southern Europe, which I think in this broader narratives about Europe also comes quite short. So this is a general statement, and I already have some questions, but maybe I will first leave the floor to you. I see the first question, or first... Já jsem Paul Ermite, novinář ze Švédska, ze Švédska, Kanady, Izraele a Česka. Šalom Irit, B. Brucha, H. B. B. Prák. Nebojte se, nebudu mluvit hebrejsky, jenom jsem pozdravil Irit jejím jazykem, hebrejštinou, ale budu s úctou k pořadateli tomuto, nebo budu mluvit česky. Uh, děkuji také, že byla dána možnost tomuto mladému svěžímu panelu, který mě velice potěšil. Děkuji také Žofii, nebo Zofii, že použila správného termínu pro holokaust, který je šoa. A potom bych se chtěl zeptat panelu, jestli některé jiné země 
nežli Švédsko, kde jsem také žil, mají podobný program pro mladé studenty jako návštěva, víceméně povinná návštěva Auschwitzu v některém z těch posledních ročníků gymnázia. Jezdil jsem tam se studenty třetích ročníků gymnázia a musím říci, že není nic nad to, kromě setkání s přeživšími holokaustu, teda šoji, nežli přijímá konfrontace s návštěvou třeba osvětiny. V několika těch autobusech, které jsem tam doprovázel, byly třeba i skinheadi. A bál jsem se, že, si nebudou, že se nebudou chovat teda náležitě při prohlídce koncentračního kábora. A byl jsem velmi překvapený, jak reagovali, dokonce až k pláči, teda že plakali ti skinheadi. A zvláště, když jsem jim řekl, že jsem přišel asi o 175 nejbližších příbuzných, kteří byli zavražděni během, během nacistického vyhlazování židů. A stačil k tomu, stačil k tomu takový, taková malá podrobnost, že jsem řekl, že, si, že jsem nikoho z těch příbuzných nikdy nepotkal osobně, ale že jsem jistý, že v těch pokojích, kde byly hromady vlasů anebo malé botičky e, obětí, e, dětí, že jsem jistý, že aspoň jedna ta botička nebo jeden ten vlas pochází z mých příbuzných. Je to skvělá iniciativa, nemluvě o výborné publikaci, která byla vydána ve Švédsku. Ve švédštině se ta kniha jmenuje Om de Tamoni Beretta, O tomto by se mělo vyprávět a je přeložená i do angličtiny a ve Švédsku vyšla ve více než milionu exemplářů. Abych došel k otázce, k panelu, chtěl bych vědět, jestli v podobných zemích nebo v zemích Evropské unie jsou podobné iniciativy. Děkuji vám. Collect uh, a few questions in next uh, with uh, uh, Mrs. Heide Marie Uhl. Thank you. Uh, I fully agree with Sophia's uh, last words that we should not. Uh, define our goal in defining a new master narrative which fits to each and any European society. Uh, this, uh, but where we can find or where we can look for common grounds is to discuss about the goals of memory in European societies. Uh, what should we learn uh, from history, from the uh, century of extremes? And, um, I really appreciate what uh, Irit Deckel said, uh, that is, uh, how do we deal with the other in our society? I think that's one of the most uh, challenging issues, uh, how do we deal with minorities? And as you said, I'm also not so sure that uh, societies in Western Europe learned about tolerance in the last decades even with all the efforts uh, done by officials and NGOs in this field. That is the one point. Uh, and that could be a common ground for each society, I think, in the context of the European Union, uh, to, to ask ourselves to be uh, self-critical, how are we dealing with the other? And there is no easy solution, as we know, because that's a really um, um, challenging question. It will stay so. Uh, one little remark. I would be careful with the term totalitarianism. Uh, I am not familiar with what's used in, in the post-communist country, countries, but in, in the Western context, it's really a term of a Cold War. It's a kind of defining a battlefield 
uh, with all these, uh, so to say, competitions in the Cold War area. So I think it would divide uh, discussions uh, just using these terms. And uh, yes, I would just uh, recommend to reflect on the term, on the, the history of the term, especially in, in Western discussions. May I thank you? I was uh, have a question for uh, Sandra Fock. Um, I was re I've read the book of uh, Tony Judd, uh, Thinkers of the 20th Century. If you're reminding us on the highway in France, and they show all these brown uh, signs, it was an, um, and mostly it's an old castle. And I said, why are these brown, brown signs on the highway? It's, it's uh, reminding the past, some special castle or um, uh, village. And then he was um, writing further, he said, it looks like that we want to bring back history to experiences. And I think if we do that, we will lose it. So I think, uh, Sandra, that with your, as I um, understood it, in your conception, you're losing history and for this, um, what I'm saying now, I have Mr. Uh, Tony Judd at my side. Thank you. Maybe we will take up two more questions and then make a break for answering. So I, if I <clears throat> see right, it was uh, Michal Kopet Kopetak uh, first. And okay. So, uh, is um, I, I, if you if you allow me uh, two uh, critical comments uh, um, or remarks, uh, the first one um, uh, you talked uh, um, uh, a lot. Or Sandra Bock uh, talked a lot about uh, technology, um, um, uh, about the online totalitarian experience. Uh, for me, it is a question how this really works. There is a huge discussion about museums, and one of the uh, and museology, and one of the great problems of museum, uh, of the institution of museum, is uh, that this uh, that museum is not the authentic place where something happened, uh, and that, th that there is a great difference between uh, people going to authentic places uh, uh, and hearing people face to face and uh, going to museums. I, I mean, the same which guilt, uh, which goes for. A uh, museum goes also from, for this, uh, uh, as you told, online totalitarian experience or uh, this online or technological um, experience, which is uh, um, also, there, is, there also is the danger um, of um, making a difference between fiction and uh, authentic uh, experience or reality. That's one comment. A more, uh, the second one, a more common one. The, this, uh, this panel was actually called New Interpretations. Uh, I would say what we heard was very interesting, but uh, these were not new interpretations, actually. These were um, well, new methods of research and uh, new methods of popularization, maybe new topics, or, although a lot of these methods and topics are um, let's say were new in the 1970s or 80s as, uh, as the everyday life. Um, 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 uh, but, but anyway, uh, these, uh, these methods may be quite new or innovative uh, in the context of researching communist dictatorship, but um, uh, it, it is new method, or a method is just the first step, uh, it's just the instrument, going to the people, hearing the people, um, hearing, uh, speaking with contemporaries, um, uh, with the others, and so on. This is not uh, this is not the solution, I would say, of the problem. Um, uh, it is uh, these instruments uh, are sometimes working great, uh, greatly. But uh, but what we still need is uh, to challenge the great narratives with with uh, let's say uh, different narratives uh, to to uh, speak or think about continuities and discontinuities, about uh, domination and agency. Uh, freedom of agency uh, about dichotomic model or about uh, distribution of responsibility and a plurality of loyalties. These are the topics which we still have somehow to challenge and um, my critical remark would be what you were talking about 
uh, is not, uh, were not the questions of interpretations. These were just the methods, and that's the first. Uh, that's one, one of the partial steps. I, um, I hope I'm just in the kind of, I, I see there was a lady here behind, yes, and, and then maybe ma we make a small break and uh, then continue. We still have some time, so I think everybody can make his statement. My question has to do with age appropriateness. I think that this panel actually focuses a lot on education, actually. And if so, then do you have debates internally uh, within your relative organizations about um, how you focus on the cognitive and emotional um, uh, readiness uh, and, uh, of, of the children who are visiting, or shall we say, also your websites, also the apps, also the exhibitions. Uh, that are clearly out in the public um, and being very easily accessed. And if so, I would very much like to learn more about your discussions because I think that they'd be of interest to all. Now we have a quite big number of questions. Um, one at the very beginning was quite general and I think addressed to everybody uh, apart from Israeli groups, which I know are partly not compulsory, but many of them are visiting Auschwitz. Um, I don't know if in any other countries there is this kind of uh, program which makes a visit to Auschwitz a, a kind of obligatory part of the school program. I don't know if you know any better. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, thanks all for the questions and uh, for the stage. Um, in Israel, it's not obligatory, but it became uh, a fashion. Um, Jackie Feldman wrote about it in his book um, about those uh, um, uh, school trips to Poland. I'm not sure I'm a great supporter of them because they happen in a context of justifying uh, certain moral and national attitudes um, that, you know, there are already quite a few writers, I mean, in, in terms of going away from victimhood and victimization, that are celebrated them. Again, you know, it's not that Jews are going to celebrate victimhoods, they're turning, I mean, they undergo great transformation and uh, the place is meaningful. Uh, I've been there once, I'll do everything not to go again and, uh, and um, you know, uh, also not with my children, but it's because I'll teach them history. Uh, and so the question is what we want to know and how we engage with history, and I'm not sure that Auschwitz uh, is the ultimate place to do it. Now, to answer the question about methods, I'm a sociologist, not a historian, and, and uh, um, the people that invited me to, uh, to present here were also open-minded enough, this doesn't happen very often in Germany, to call me coming from Germany. Uh, now, I'm usually presented as the Israeli uh, historian. I'm, you know, I'm also in, in the US and in other, you know, places, I'm an academic, I'm presented as coming from a certain institute I'm coming from. So, um, I didn't talk about methods. I used this um, as, um, as a way to talk about turning points, which is the topic of, of this uh, of this big event, uh, and I said uh, we fail to take some turns in a Weberian sense. I'm sorry to be, a, uh, I mean, to take the philosophy of sociology more seriously. I'm not sorry, actually. Um, and, um, uh, and, and to say, well, you know, when, when Max Weber asked uh, about the objective possibility of where history takes a turn, and he asked, well, if, if we abolish slavery, could we get to capitalism faster? We didn't. We could have, uh, because we didn't abolish slavery. And so turning points, I mean, he talks about after the fall of the Roman Empire. So to bring together, I mean, I appreciate and, 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 uh, and, and very much study and, and learn from, from the historical text. But what I employ here, and I have nothing against methods, uh, is, a, is a call to see the, 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 the roads not taken, to see the political potentialities of actually dealing with, the, with, fall, uh, with failed regimes uh, that were totalitarian um, uh, to people's lives, all you know, lives that you know and, and, and many of you experienced, and to think about otherness in our midst with that, um, and so in that regard, yeah. Now, I, I very much agree that we have to ask ourselves, what are the goals of memory projects? Um, and, uh, and, you know, this is what... Um, um, 
well, German studies scholars uh, and uh, ethnographers in, in Michigan University now uh, read as exclusionary inclusion uh, of the other in, in, in Germany, right? I mean, I include you in, in if, if, if you're just willing to talk about Nazi Germany, you're welcome. Uh, come to the archive, and I, I'll even acknowledge that you speak German, although at some, you know, in some elevators it would be questioned. And so um, that's, uh, I mean, and, and, and this, is, this could be a turning point. Two more turning points, and now I'll talk like a historian. One, uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, that's important for, you know, I mean, if we're dealing specifically with that, with that question. One is the question of, uh, um, uh, of um, well, Luther Art brought it up last year with uh, uh, the question of, oh, okay, we have things at home that we could acknowledge. I mean, we, it's not all the we, but, uh, but with the idea that, you know, property. And the other is uh, our mothers, our fathers, which was very much evaded, um, you know, the serious in, in, in Poland and the Czech Republic. And so if that brings up more of a perpetrator's narrative, which we also don't have, uh, then we can bring together more methods. And I very much agree in a, in a, in a cooperative uh, way, which is great. Yeah. I think there were quite a lot of questions which were addressed to Sandra Vox. So. Yes, uh, thank you for all the remarks. Um, I will try to answer as much as possible uh, to multiple questions in, in one answer. Um, definitely, I do agree that there are a lot of challenges that we're facing um, in, in the current situation of uh, technology and life uh, intermingling. And um, the question about uh, whether we're about to lose history if, um, if we keep on progressing this way, I would say that, that history is not something that we could lose, per se. I would say that um, the way that it's being told is going to change regardless of, of what we do or, or, or think, um, because as I said, it's going to be increasingly bottom-up. Everybody will be able to tell their own version of history. Everybody will be able to distribute their version of, of history. What the challenge is going to be is how to educate young people in finding trustworthy sources. That's one challenge. And the other one is how to organize ourselves, our organizations, in a way that we are transparent and trustworthy. People are going to choose their sources based on, first of all, trustworthiness, and second of all, its general um, appeal, eventually. Just, just to give an example of what, we were, what, I, what I mean, when we were talking about educating young people, um, I was involved in a research project for developing an app um, for, for for young people, um, but this was uh, more about health policy. And I was working with a focus group who were uh, shown different web information sources on uh, health issues such as smoking and drinking. And the focus group was asked, would you read this information? Um, what do you think about this, this website? And the, the, the responses were, Interesting. Firstly, if the, if the website looked as if, if, if it was made in the 90s, they would not uh, pay too much attention to it. So, and there were several other comments like that, you know, if uh, this, the text was too wide, if there was too much text, if there weren't any bullet points, then people would not focus too much time on it. So it's more a matter of Packaging and trustworthiness, that's, that's one thing. Um, and then following from that, and I will combine uh, the, this answer with the uh, question about the virtual um, or online totalitarian experience. History research is still going to take place. The difference is that history researchers are going to or should be working closer with other in industries such as IT and creative industries uh, for, the, for the reason I mentioned earlier. The way the, the project I mentioned um, is being carried out is basically starting with collecting different stories from people around the Baltic region, con uh, conducting interviews, asking about their family, their life, their family history, 
then the researchers will be brought together. Those interviews, the information is going to be analyzed. Based on this analysis, we are going to put together some kind of systemized picture of what happened during a certain time period in this certain um, region. And then based on this analysis, we're going to develop firstly the packaging to, to show this material, which would be the online experience, the way people will acquire this information. And secondly, developed to, together, again, each process involves relevant experts, um, develop the methods to then teach people to use those new um, information sources and materials, including schools. And I think it's important as we, um, there was another uh, question here on that. Um, I think it's, it's important to make a difference why, what is our purpose of, of the, this particular um, project or, or um, effort. If, we, if the purpose is to educate, then again, there are different means to, uh, to do it. One would be online. Another one would be perhaps something we also um, are carrying out at the foundation, which would be model international criminal court simulations, for example, where you use actual historical cases and have young people play out uh, the, the court simulations with different roles, the prosecutors, the defense, the judges, the media, and so forth. So this, this provides another way of, of um, approaching history without losing the original sources. And um, in terms of whether the children are emotionally ready for the experience, um, another um, example of a, of a project, a film project that we're carrying out, um, it is, it is possible to bring students together or young people together. Um, of course, th there has to be some age limit um, and, and the content needs to be you know, limited in the sense of, of uh, whether they're really ready to handle it. But it's possible to bring them together, have them discuss um, different versions or understandings of history, go and talk to their parents, their families, bring them together again, and together with the history teacher, have them develop, um, whether it's fictional or based on a real story, have them de develop their own movie about it. And this is, this is again an interdisciplinary effort. You bring together the history teacher, you use actual sources, you use your own family stories, you use the media teacher, so that uh, you will immerse both the information, the technology, the family experience, and put it together into a package which teaches perhaps more than reading a text uh, in, within a textbook. I will maybe short to <clears throat> try to reply to some of the questions. There was the question about the new methods, new old methods and uh, interpretations. Of course, social history and everyday history is not a new method. It's, uh, uh, but uh, I guess for, uh, at least in Poland, I guess also in other Eastern European, Central Eastern European countries, for the first decades after 89, it was very much focused on political history of obvious reasons because there were so many basics which had to be um, made clear, which had to be researched, yes. So there was a need for this basic event, history of events and, 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 and political history. But of course I didn't go into the interpretations, I only had a 10 minutes, but I guess this is so that uh, the methods, but also the questions, I tried to name some of the questions, kind of already imply some interpretations. So for example, if we say we focus more on the post-Stalinism times, it means we focus less on the terror, but on how um, communism influenced a deeper social change, how uh, people adapted to the uh, system. Yes, so I guess this already, uh, it's more about maybe not so much collaboration, but a adaptation than collaboration and resistance and repression. Yes, I, I guess already these questions imply some 
some interpretations, if this is for the moment enough. The second question I would just like shortly to address is this question of what, we, um, what common goals we have or <clears throat> what did we learn from the age of extremes. So um, I think to make it very short and referring to um, um, Marcy Shore again, I think one important question is this um, question of mechanisms of collaboration, servitude, uh, becoming part of a um, system, of a regime. Um, but I think also a bit too, not enough mentioned here is this, uh, what I would call the again the dynamic of being in opposition to being in resistance and not again in this very heroic sense we have big heroes and we have to talk about them but um, I was lately in Mechel and there is a new one year old uh, let's say holocaust exhibition museum on holocaust or on the Shoah in, in Belgium um, and um, <clears throat> I we talked there to um, the director, Van Goethem, and he said actually for him, Belgium has a very interesting history in that respect because it, during uh, the Nazi occupation, this be local authorities were quite a bit free to react in different ways. So there are grave differences, for example, between Brussels and Antwerp. And he said what is actually more interesting for him are not the collaborators, but those who resisted and why they did resist. And it's not only because they were, I don't know, very, uh, I don't know, let's say, philosemitic. Some were anti-Semites before the war, but still because of different reasons they did resist. So wh what are the mechanisms of not, co not collaborating with the regime? I think this is another question. And the last thing is, um, I guess history, of course, we can learn from history, but I think it's not only about applying history to now, like what did we learn, how shall we behave now, but history for me is also about understanding where we are now. So one of the questions is how, again, how the societies were changed but by what happened in a deeper way to really understand where we are now. For example, um, how, how, uh, how the functioning of uh, autocratic regimes influences changes in social memory or many other examples. So I guess it's not only about kind of uh, direct use of history to our time, but also about understanding of where we are. Um, maybe we make now the second last round of questions. There was a lady here which uh, wanted to ask a question, but she's gone at the moment. So just a moment, I will, I think yeah, here, I think you were. Ja volám sa Roman Kwiatkowski, ja som prišiel z Polska, aby sa snažiť mluviť po česky, pretože veľa rokov spolupracujem s českými institúciami. Chcem povedať takto, dneska aj včera som počúval tie dva panele, veľmi veľa si mluvil o pamięci, o pamięci občanov europejských. Ja myslím, že tých občanov patrí tiež rovne Sintovia aj Romovia. Keď mluvíme o technológiách, keď mluvíme o metodikách, jak máme učiť na budúcnosť kolejné mládež, żeby ta pamięć nie została zabudnięta, tak w przypadku przykładu Sintu i Romów, to ja myślę, że aj Sintowie, aj Romowie w tych metodykach, aj w, tych, w całym systemie edukacyjnym muszą się pojawić. Ja zajmuję się otazką Holokaustu od, od zawsze. Najbliższa moja rodzina zginęła w Auschwitz, w Bełżcu, a w Bergen-Belsen. Ja myślę, że tak to, że Romowie dneska mają nieco też do zaoferowania. Myśmy wiele roków pracowali na to, żeby przebić się do tego systemu edukacyjno-europskiego, żeby nieco ukazać, żeby przyszli pedagodzy, a młodzież, kiedy idzie do Oswięcimia, żeby oprócz Holokaustu Żydów czy Shoa, Polaków, a innych obcianów również pamiętali o Holokauście Sintów a Romów. Taka ekspozycja jest. Każdego roku pozerają nad 100 tysięcy ludzi. To jest wynikający ładunek edukacyjny. Na poslednim czasu podarło nam się wspólnie z niemieckimi Sintami a Romami przybudnąć pamięć europejską Holokaustu Romów w Berlinie. Monument. 
Do końca mamy niedaleko stąd lety. Mamy chodonim. My, mężczyzna, największa mężczyzna w Europie, mamy prawo mieć do pamięci europejskie, powiedzmy obcianie. Mamy swoje prawa konstytucyjne, a ustawowe. Ale to bym chciał zaapelować do edukatorów, żeby w tych metodykach, a w tych technologiach edukacja o Holokauście, ale nie tylko, bo Romowie też byli ofiarami systemów totalitarnych. Byli też w opozycjach. Mamy znakomitego człowieka, obciana Czeskiej Republiki, pana Karla Holomka, wynikający dysydent, wynikający człowiek, intelektualista romski, a taki myślę, że naszła i w Polsku. Myślę, że chciałbym podziękować za, za tu pozwanku. Myślę, że my jesteśmy obcianie Europy, a będziemy się snażyć jak najwięcej y, 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 mówić o tym, po to, żeby ta e, europejska integracja też tej kawasy AI, AI Sinti Romów w Europie. Dziękuję bardzo. Dziękuję um, for the very inspiring panel. Um, I would like to bring another note here, which is a little bit uh, pessimistic, coming from Bulgaria and having experience for the last 25 years teaching history both in the, in the United States and in Bulgaria. Um, I'm very much wondering about the assessment of what is done by the academic uh, elite researchers and everything that we described here, including new technologies, etc., etc., and the, the way the, the public responds to it. Uh, let me quote very quickly the last um, uh, research done in Bulgaria. And I'm doing research at the American University in, in Bulgaria where we have students coming from 50 different, mostly post-communist countries. So I do have a tremendous data about the level of their knowledge. The majority of them, say 80, overwhelming majority of them, around 85% of them has, have absolutely no knowledge about communism. When we ask them what is Gulag, they say this is something uh, like uh, Google, so we're uh, trying to find, the, or Kulak, they, they refer to Gulag as Kulak or, or Google. 1% um, uh, of Bulgarian students know that there were concentration camps during communist times, etc., etc. I'm not going to. So this is my first and very important question. Do you have some uh, relevant um, ways to assess the way um, all the efforts coming from uh, both academic historians and in, uh, in, uh, um, NGOs um, uh, actually are internalized by both students and, uh, and the big public because we're actually this is the goal of education. And second thing that I'm, I really think it's extremely important, although we don't have time to do everything, of course, but um, the results about, um, um, say, uh, uh, the data coming from the interviews regarding the um, effect of oral history and especially um, uh, research done on uh, and dissemination of the research on everyday life shows that um, there is a special um, phenomenon that I called somatization of, of the memory. Uh, the, the, Tremendous nostalgia that Bulgaria is a champion in, in this uh, field goes through the, uh, how to say, the memory of the stomach or the memory of how secure was our everyday life in terms of uh, um, uh, vodka and, um, and uh, food, etc., etc. So, and it stops there, which I think it's a huge problem in terms of uh, how uh, uh, new generations are learning about everyday life and how they assess um, um, uh, history. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to go back to Lenka's idea of, uh, oh, you had your hand. <laughs> that uh, Lenka, you had the idea of uh, not putting the old man into the glass box, and and then um, this is actually something that I think Adorno wrote about the museum as mausoleum. And I think I can understand the feeling of not making museums into mausoleums, into cemeteries, into places 
that are no longer interesting. However, when they get to be so extreme, as Sandra is suggesting, then I think we are doing something very dangerous, and I echo my neighbor here uh, in thinking about Tony Judd. Um, the idea to ex re-experience history in an online way um, has great problems because that means then the historian must, or the viewer, must identify with somebody, whether it's a victim, a perpetrator, a collaborator. And is this something historians should do? This was raised in the historian's debate in the 1980s as well. So I would really be very careful about this online experience, which leads not to empathy, but dangerous identification. And now, hello, I'm going to give it to you. Yeah, I'm going to give it to you. Okay. Um, thank you very much also for your presentations. I have uh, one remark for Sandra. I think it's highly interesting how people are reacting to your presentation. Because I'm a journalist, I see it as a new form of storytelling, which I think definitely needs to be done in the historian's profession, so that's more how I see it. It's not such a threat, but how can you frame stories differently to echo the motto from earlier? Um, then I have a question for Ms. Deco. In your presentation, what would you say when we look at active bearers of memory, what society does in actual fact create the condition that people can be active bearers of memory? Because if you look at it, if you look at how disputed uh, politics of remembrance are, who is actually seen as a subject, what you perfectly illustrated um, in your presentation, then I think it's also a question that goes back to the notion of empathy, which society creates the condition that people can be active bearers of memory, and what could be a transnational approach to that? Thank you. Well. Chance. Okay. okay. The last time, uh, I okay. try to be short. Uh, no, I had a question actually, actually, which is in a way connecting to uh, some of the questions and discussions going on, and this is, I think, especially question to Lenka and to Sandra. And Sandra put it in a way that history is now ceasing to be represented as interpretations, and it's more of experience. As a historian, obviously, I am concerned about it. Not that I would fear that much that I will lose my job uh, very soon, but I think um, in this way, it seems to me that. You know, historians are relegated to the deep, uh, to the heap of uh, of history with their interpretations. And my question is actually how you, in your projects and in your organization, see the role of the historians. I don't know who was it. I think maybe Susan Sonsa, who said that the notion of collective memory nowadays is just another notion of ideology. We are not anymore uh, using the notion of ideology so much, and we talk about collective memory. This is the same thing. I would not be that radical as Susan Sontag, but I think that. Uh, Alida Asman reacted to it and said, yeah, this is exactly because collective memory is now just another name of ideology. This is exactly why historians are still important. Historians as guardians of this rational discourse on history, the guardians of the analytical uh, uh, approach to history, historians as guardians of the discourse on different interpretations of history, as against uh, exactly the sort of... Uh, uh, memory uh, discourse on history, uh, the emotionality of memories, the memories are always self-asserting, but are not always necessarily communicating with each other. So, I mean, many people, Kozelek, Aleida Asman, many others, would sort of see it as a, uh, you know, dialectic relationship between the rationalistic discourse of history and historiography and history making and the, let's say, emotional discourse of memory. How do you see it? Because I haven't seen the place of historians in your, especially you too, uh, presentation. Thank you. Two years ago, the European platform of European, uh, the platform of uh, European memory and conscience, proposed to the European Commission to make a pan-European study about the knowledge about the young people in Europe about the totalitarian regimes. And it was the decision of the ministries of justice uh, of the European Union to, be, to make this study. But this study is not made until now. So my questions to Sandra is uh, the, uh, about the initiative of the House of European Histories in Brussels to organize such study among the young people in Europe because without data, about the output of our activities as 
uh, teachers, historians, uh, sociologists, etc., we cannot in Europe know what is the result of our activities. We need such study and will be initiative in this uh, direction. My question would be to Irit, that you mentioned in your talk about... Uh, I'm very sorry if there are some questions, but I think now we have to... We have to close uh, the debate, so I will maybe give short uh, the voice to, to uh, the panel, and, and, and then we can discuss during the lunch later. Uh, I think, Irit, there were some, quite some questions to you. Yeah. Okay, maybe I'll, I mean, I think that your question uh, could, could kind of embrace uh, some others. Um, you know, uh, it, online we can have, uh, um, um, uh, you know, storytelling uh, platforms that are quite successful. I mean, we see it with the Asbestos Project in, uh, Asbestos project, uh, in um, Australia, actually. Uh, so, I mean, we have amazing projects that, that do it. I want to kind of talk about the identification and empathy uh, issue. I don't think that by uh, making people empathetic to some victims, uh, they learn uh, politically, political engagement. And that would be an, a very short answer about active barriers of memory. Because from you know, my study in the Holocaust Memorial, I saw and also the guides kept telling, well, it's easier to identify with Anne Frank than, than, than with Speer, although we saw that Speer is, is a great, you know, also. Uh, I mean, it was popular. So, so uh, and I'm not talking about Hitler, which which is, you know, it, that's an epitomizing, I mean, to, to refer to the uh, uh, Bulgarian, um, uh, I mean, memory note, uh, that's somatic also. I mean, to say which actors actually get to the form, what kind of identification we, uh, we get to, and what kind of reverence. Uh, so I would say not through identification. I don't want people to love Jews um, uh, or to love victims um, because they were victims. Um, and also to feel mercy, um, uh, you know, for them. I would say in order to, to create active barriers of memory, of course, we have to go back to thinking um, about minorities, um, you know, and, and citizenship as something that enriches us, and thinking about memory as, 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 um, as a dynamic um, playground. Uh, that is not dynamic and, and, and another playground for everyone, but we can then teach and um, through those two understandings. There's much more, but I'm, I, I respect the, uh, the time frame, so. Um, would you like to? Mm -hmm. um. Um, ja bych uh, ráda reagovala prvně na váš mm, koment, na vaši poznámku, uh, kde jste říkala, že je tam vlastně velké nebezpečí, že se návštěvníci identifikují, že nebezpečí identifikace. Já bych um, ráda spíš poukázala na to, Samozřejmě, je tam velké nebezpečí identifikace, záleží na tom, jakou formu zvolíme, jak to vlastně uděláme, jak to bude promyšlené, jak to bude probíhat. Ale já, když jsem řekla, že není dobré strkat tady ty příběhy za sklo, tak jsem spíš myslela tím, že je dobré ukazovat různé perspektivy a otvírat ostatním ty možnosti, aby si udělali vlastní názor na to, co vlastně, jak, jaké to vlastně může být. Um. Right, mm -hmm. online. Um, I'll try to give a very brief answer just by explaining the project. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, absolutely, I do agree that uh, it shouldn't be black and white in, in the sense of um, uh, forming some sort of ideology based on uh, the oral historical representations. So the way we have thought about creating this uh, environment would be to involve not only the storytellers, but also the historians, the history researchers, the analysts at every stage. And each um, story would also be its own little world with additional materials. So you can even have uh, the effect where, where the oral story is something different than the material surrounding it. So you can go and, and actually see the, see the controversies that history entails. Um, 
so a large part of this experience would be also uh, to develop critical thinking towards the sources and towards the, the oral history or, or the way history has been written because there are different ways of writing history as well. There are different ways of, as we talk about interpretations. So I, I would like to stress that um, there, there are several challenges and this is something, th this is why we need to collaborate um, interdisciplinarily. Um, it is extremely important to have historians present at every stage and the analysts present at every stage as well as assess what the effects are. And I, I'm not trying to propose that, that myself or uh, the organization I work at has all the answers. Um, what I am trying to do is um, get us a look into the future and prepare for what is going to happen. So uh, we need to kind of work towards uh, preparing ourselves in that sense. And uh, feel free to approach me uh, so I can give more details since we don't have much time left anymore. Okay, I, will, I think we should close now. I can only say I will take this idea of research on historical knowledge to my um, boss, Taya Wovkwan. How, but as far as I know, there is some uh, research already done by the European institutions on the level of historical knowledge uh, or the content of historical knowledge of young people in different European countries. Um, I, I was asked to tell that uh, an announcement is to be made, a practical, technical announcement. So. How does it work? Okay. Uh, I would like to make a small announcement just before lunch, not about the food, but about a, a small uh, excursion we will do uh, on Saturday to the memorial, Jewish memorial of Czernowice. My name is Michael Daimel. I was born in Prague and living now in Germany and for many years I am dealing with art and memory and uh, 11 years ago I built a memorial in Czernowice and as Pavel, uh, as I got uh, information about uh, this uh, uh, symposium here this year in Prague, I asked uh, European Commission to organize uh, um, excursion to go in frame of this um, of this uh, uh, congress or conference uh, to Chernobyl, but there was already fixed plan to go to Ligice as uh, important memorial here. So we have an additional offer for for you all uh, to come with us uh, on Saturday. Uh, to we will uh, European Commission told me now they will pay a bus and we can go together uh, to Czernowice. So if there are some people here interested to go um, from 9:30 um, from Prague, there is about uh, 100 kilometers, uh, 110 kilometers to Czernowice, and we will come back on Saturday afternoon to Prague. So if there are some interested people, they are welcome, and uh, please uh, make a subscription or to tell me uh, who wants to go, because I have to make a list in order to know uh, how many places do we need in a bus? So if, the, if, you, uh, if you will see in the beginning of, the, of, the, um, of, the ta of these tables, there are some information about uh, memorial of Czernowice, and you can uh, talk to me in, in the afternoon, or I will put you into list. So we have now about three to four interested people to come, so we are invited to make the group a little bit uh, bigger. So thank you to European Commission to, to this offer, uh, to pay the bus, and good appetite. Thank you very much to the panelists and to the vivid discussion. <laughs>